The story that you are about to hear is one that has been, for the last 70 years, left to wither in the hearts of those few who recall it. Of the 12 of us present that day, only I remain, and my own end is rapidly approaching. I tell this tale today with shaky hands, solely in order to console myself in my final moments as I hope anyone who may discover this will refrain from passing judgment upon me or my comrades until the end. I distinctly recall sitting in a tent with my fellow soldiers just outside of Berlin, huddling around a shortwave radio and listening to the trials of our nation's greatest foes. They feigned insanity, pled guilty, gave harrowing accounts of every detail and every single crime committed by their hand or under their watch. My favorites, however, were the ones who pled innocent, the ones who said, I was just following orders. I had to wonder what I would say. Had the war ended with Moscow under the Iron Eagle? What would I say if asked to justify my actions in war? I believe I know exactly what I would say. And it would be the same as the men being jeered by the entire Red Army, excluding the ten of us gathered in the tent. You see, the two lucky of us had already died. It was a quiet village in East Germany, December 24th, 1944. We were under orders to seek out any soldiers lying in wait to ambush the main column of the army. Our Sergeant Ivan took the lead the rest of us falling in behind him. It was raining heavily, obscuring our vision. A sharp crack jerked me to attention, and I immediately fell to my stomach. I smelled smoke and heard a thump in the dirt a dozen feet ahead of me. The sound of gunfire roared in my ears as we returned fire. We had no idea where the shot had come from, so each among us took our best guess and fired in that direction. We knew we would not hit the shooter, but we had hoped to at least scare him off. I decided to hold my fire in order to cover my comrades as they reloaded their guns. When the fire stopped, I watched carefully the nearby houses. A quick movement by a roadside fence caught my eye, and I quickly shot off a couple of rounds at the dark mass. At least one of my shots must have landed, because whatever it was fell to the ground, unmoving. By now, my fellow soldiers had finished reloading, and so I ejected my magazine and slid a new one in its place. We were still for some time, waiting for the returning of fire, but it never came, and instead Ivan came up to a crouch and quietly walked over to the corpse. He felt the pulse and then returned to us. Yeah, we got him, he said. In his eyes, I saw something I hadn't seen before. A deep kind of sadness and regret, almost like he wasn't telling the truth. No matter how I pushed, he would not tell me why. We stood and casually walked over to the house where the shooter had come from. Ivan knocked on the door. We waited a moment and Ivan firmly planted his foot on the door, rearing to kick the door down when a shotgun blast blew through the door. Ivan fell to the ground, riddled with buckshot. We returned fire through the door, then swiftly beat it down with the stock of our rifles. Inside, broken glass littered the floor and bullet holes scattered along the walls. On the ground was a young woman, shot fatally four times. In her hand was the shotgun that killed Ivan. We had had more than enough of this village. Our patients were definitely out. We ransacked the house, throwing over tables and filling our pockets with valuables. When we had finished, we threw gas lamps onto the floor and tossed matches on the pooling liquid. We left the house ablaze. It was only once we were outside, again, that we heard the wailing. By then the flames had taken hold and it was too late to re-enter the building. The mother had hidden her baby before turning to fight us with a shotgun and we hadn't found it before torching the house. The wails continued for a few minutes before falling silent among the cackling of flames. 
A man burst from a building down the street and sprinted toward us, screaming in German. Our translator gaped at him, and when we raised our rifles, he held up his hand to stop us. The German man shoved past us and up to the burning building. He hesitated only briefly at the doorway before running through. He never came back out. By the time the fire had died, we couldn't see it anymore. The rest of our mission went along by silence. When we doubled back to where we came, we found people standing in the street, staring at us. Some were angry, some sad, but most had just a blank stare. I see them still in my nightmares. When we passed by the house, I stopped. I announced to no one particular that I had to take a leak. No one believed it, but that didn't matter. I stepped into the shell of the house we had destroyed. There on the floor in the bedroom, I saw the skeleton of a man crushed under a wooden beam, a smaller collection of mishap and bones in his arms. In the yard by the fence, I saw a little boy with a toy gun dressed in the oversized uniform of a German soldier. That night, we all had nightmares. The man with his wild eyes told each of us that he would be back for us one after the other. The next day, we had laughed it off together we had thrown ourselves into our duties. We had fought hard not to think about the screaming man and the wailing baby, but it was impossible to ignore it. One by one, as the years went by, each of us died. Here, one of us fell from a tower where they were working construction. Another had an aggressive form of brain cancer that suddenly appeared in his brain. Never obvious, but always suspicious to us because we wondered, was it him? Was it him that was coming back to us one at a time as he promised? When there were just two of us left, Joseph and I, he had come to visit Joseph. When he had knocked, Joseph thought his time had come, and I should have known I would be the last. He's coming for me, Joseph said. It is my time now. I would have liked to have consoled him to assure him that it was all a coincidence, but we both knew better. That night, Joseph cried on my shoulder and I on his. I'm so sorry, he had sobbed, I didn't know. The next day, he shot himself in his apartment, an act of suicide. That was a week ago, and now it is my turn. I know the man is coming. Every night in my sleep, he gazes into my eyes and smiles. Every night he smiles wider in my dreams. Last night in my dreams, he began to speak. Quietly, so quiet I cannot hear any of what he says other than make out that he is speaking to me. Honestly, I don't even want to hear what he has to say. I will stay up tonight as late as possible, and before I sleep I will climb to the roof and stand on the edge. I must. I cannot know what he will say. The shot at us, the woman that killed Ivan. We couldn't have known about the baby. We were just eliminating the resistance and only following our orders.